listening to the 14th Source for all geeky and nerdy news and discussion, which means that you're listening to a podcast. For all intents and purposes. I am D. Bethel. And I'm Andrew Asplund. And we are your two overeducated, codependent nerd hosts, bringing you the things that we like to talk about, but filtered through inquisitive and critical lenses. In the episode for Friday, April 26th, 2024. And it's been a minute, things have been busy, things have been crazy, there's been injuries, there's been busyness, I've been grading, I hurt my finger, it's all crazy. I will actually, I will say that uh, a friend of the show who I won't name actually reached out. Oh. So, I, I thought, like, and to answer that question, I said, yeah, we're, we're okay, you know. Yeah, uh, things are generally fine. Ish. If, if there's ever not an episode, just assume Andrew and I are fighting. And what we should do, just to start the show, Andrew, is embrace... Or not? There's been some news, Andrew, about a big company called I think it's the Embracer Group. Wow, that was that. That's you just. Oh my God, I didn't realize. It, like, oh, embracing. I love. Oh, oh no, you're talking about that. Oh, I'm a, oh, I'm a, I'm a master of the of the profession of here, the Andrew. rhetoric. Right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> the Embracer Group, if you don't know, went on a buying spree. I was was pre-pandemic even, but definitely during the pandemic, they were just buying. Everything I I know mostly from there just scooping up video game studios, right? But apparently they were just scooping up studios across all media, and as has been the case, I, I believe it might have been like three, maybe six months ago that just like every tech company, they've been announcing layoffs and announcing cost cutting measures, and just recently they announced a very Interesting new approach to their business. What they actually what they announced was, hey, this is the company that basically bought everything you loved, right? And uh, embraced everything you love. Embraced everything. Thank you. And they're going to basically break up into three standalone publicly listed entities mm-hmm. at Nasdaq Stockholm. That's the title of the press release. But basically, they're, they're saying, hey, we're we're this this company that bought all this shit and now we're like oops too much Burp. we're going to break up into three separate groups and they've said that it's going to be three entertainment companies Asmodee Group and I say that one because that's the only name that apparently they've decided on the other two actually have footnote a uh, name to be decided at a later time they have thrown some temporary names on there right coffee stain and friends and friends is important yes middle earth enterprises and friends so it's it's this idea that they they're basically saying like oops <laughs> it's not working let's break up right and they bought so many companies like right. it's is this thing where we've talked about them before like mm-hmm. you even said like it's just another video game company has been embraced. Right, like, right. Like, they're all fucking vampires, and this is the 90s. But the, the I shared this this news story with you, particularly because I, it sort of is a news story that crossed our interests, because, like, the video game stuff, but there's also table stuff. So, like, just to... I want to give you a quick, like, overview of... This is going to be very quick, because to list all the studios and, and properties they own would take... The whole episode. Like, that's right. all we talk about, just listing them. Right. For those that know, they bought a company called THQ Nordic, which is Nordic was a company that bought the remnants of the company THQ and, and basically all the properties that they own. They own Dark Horse Media, which includes Dark Horse Comics, Dark Horse Entertainments, and the online comics uh, vendor Things from Another World. They own Free Mode, which owns limited run games. If you're if you're familiar with with what they do. They own Ghost Ship Games. They own Coffee Saint Studios, as we could... They own Aspire. They pour a lot of games Porter. to PC. <laughs> yeah. Um, they own Eidos Montreal. They own Crystal Dynamics. Like, these huge Zen Studios. <laughs> like, they own like own kind of everybody in some shape or form. They, they, they've put their finger in everybody's tea. And I remember when it was happening, like, everyone was saying, this doesn't sound like a good idea. Um, but you couldn't stop them. I think for me, what what surprised me about the announcement was I learned they bought someone who I didn't know they bought. Right. Um, but also what it points out, and you kind of you basically laid out there, they just bought everybody. Everything. Right. Like it's shocking. And the thing is that the when I said they broke up into these three groups, mm-hmm. the one that like stood out to me was Asmodee. Right. Because Asmodee was already a company that basically bought up 
the board game industry. They own like, Days of Wonder, Fantasy Flight, Plaid Hat. Yeah, they were the the ones who absorbed so <laughs> much of, of board gaming that, like, you're not Wizards of the Coast. You're Asmodee. You're Asmodee, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and they did it. Oh, but what Asmodee is actually owned by this, you know, whatever company. The reason why we want to just talk about it real quick is the fact that, like, in the press release, they're like, oh, we're going to break it up. It's going to be fine. Oh, by the way, Asmodee of of this breakup process Mm -hmm. is going to be saddled with a financing agreement that basically gives them almost a billion euro of debt. Jesus. A tabletop gaming company. They're they're mafia they're mafia killing Asmodee, it sounds like. Well, I mean, like it's it's this is the kind of thing where it feels like was it the what when, when Toys R Us got like dis- destroyed, it was a uh, private equity, right? That's right, what it felt right. like. Like someone bought this thing just to dump debt on it and destroy it. <laughs> right, because right. like, oh, well, well, dump the debt and move on. And it's like, wow, wait, you're going to do that to Asmodee, which is okay, except they literally are the company that owns so many board games right. that, like, dominate the market. Asmodee, uh, you mentioned Fantasy Flight, Days of Wonder, mm-hmm. Mayfair Games. They bought all of the games, which includes Settlers of Catan. They have the license to uh, Carcassonne, Ticket to Ride. Carcassonne, Ticket to Ride, Jesus. and uh, Settlers of Catan. Those are basically the three, like what we used to call the the trinity of of intro board games, right? You know that weren't just fucking Monopoly. <laughs> well, speaking of Monopoly, <laughs> all owned by <laughs> yeah, all owned by this one company who's now apparently dumping also all their debt onto it, right? Bizarre. Uh, Fantasy Flight, which owns a lot of weird shit, but also licenses to what Star Wars, a lot of Chaosium, like Lovecraft mm-hmm. shit. It is. Wild. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen because, you know, um, you were in a, a late stage capitalism and yikes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if they're kind of using this as a place to dump debt and it sinks it for whatever reason, like that could have a profound effect on I, at least the, the trip, God, for lack of a better word, AAA tabletop development in a lot of ways. If asthma defalls, like that creates a a strange landscape afterwards, right? But is it weird that the company that publishes currently, at least in the U.S., Settlers of Catan, mm-hmm. is now basically a dump for debt? Right, <laughs> right, right. I, and don't get me wrong, I don't play Settlers of Catan anymore. But that's that's wild, right? But it is still like an onboarding point for so many people. Like, probably because they play it on their phones first. Or they play it on... Consoles first, or it's yeah. it's the game that a lot of people like. Hey, you want to play a, a board game that's not Monopoly, right? Like, right. I mean, you listed all those. Like all those are gateway drugs yeah, for like whatever. Right? Catan, Ticket to Ride, uh, Carcassonne. Like it's that's crazy that oh, they're putting that owner in a position, right? In such a position. It's whew. we'll see. Like so, like this is just this just happened this week. We'll see kind of how this plays out. And if anything shifts, of course, we'll report in on for quote unquote report in on it. Yeah, yeah. We'll, just, um, we'll yeah, complain yeah. about it. We're not going to call ourselves journalists quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to learn through a tw- through a message from me that, that Asmodee was part of Embracer. I just, again, I didn't realize it. But I think it was because they were so big, right? Like, how can something so big be, be embraced? Right. And apparently not much of a grip. So anyway, uh, speaking of late stage capitalism, there's a new TV show that mm. uh, we're going to talk about, which is, I guess, weirdly based on a video game. Right. Not owned by Embracer. No, owned by Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, owned by Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we actually, we're going to talk uh, a bit about Fallout. Yes, the Amazon uh, show. The Amazon show, based on the series owned by Microsoft. Yep. But, you know, currently... Bethesda, previously Black Isle slash Interplay. Fallout, I have spoken about to length. Uh, Indeed. Anyone that knows me knows that I have a weird obsession about uh, with that game. Right. And now there's a TV show. Did, did you... I'm guessing you did, because you were like one of my PC playing friends. You were one of those weirdos. You played the original two Fallouts on PC? Uh, I, I definitely played the original, the first one. Mm-hmm. Because... Uh, 
at some point it was GURPS Fallout. Uh, oh, you're right. It was GURPS, yeah. I mean, it's that's a weird story. Uh, mm-hmm. I actually, I don't, I played the second one a little bit, but I mm-hmm. never got that far in it. Bethesda took over the license. And mm-hmm. uh, many years later, Fallout Three came out, and we haven't. Yes, and and they haven't looked back. With the the small hiccup of, I mean, it's not even hiccup. That was a rude word for it. But uh, with uh, Fallout New Vegas, developed by Obsidian I Entertainment, mean, some, most people say the hiccup was Fallout Seventy Six. <laughs> That's true. New Vegas is interesting because Obsidian is is a studio made up of a former Black Isle employees, right. uh, who obviously, as you said, worked on the original games. And the discourse around New Vegas alone is is interesting, but. Honestly, the discourse around Fallout is interesting. Mm -hmm. But here we have a TV show, a whole new discourse that is kind of taking the world by storm. Fallout, the TV show, is a huge success. Apparently, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my wife heard about it on NPR. And she's like, we should check out that Fallout show. I'm like, you don't have to tell me twice. Wait, what? what? (laughs) I'm sorry, what? All right. (laughs) Right, like, what? That's actually one of the interesting things that I wanted to kind of bring to the table here is that one. she said... (laughs) <laughs> what was it that that NPR the, the NPR story said is I think that the phrasing they used was like the the follow-up passed the mom test meaning that obviously it's a it's a show based on a very popular video game series a lot of people are coming to this to this uh, show with a lot of different knowledge bases and and histories right people that played the original PC games people that came in Fallout three or four people that Maybe it just played Fallout Shelter. I don't know, but lo- <laughs> like the, the <laughs> sure the lore is out there, and like The Last of Us, like other, well, I guess the Halo show. Technically, people are coming to this with with the, with a fandom, but as NPR put it, the the mom test as well. It passes that test in that it's a show that you can you can sit your mom down with you. Although I don't know if I recommend it. Not your mom, and they can follow the show and enjoy it. Without needing to be a nerd who's played all the video games. And so my wife and I have watched The Last of Us. And I played both of those games. And I, again, that's a that's a pretty narrative heavy game series in its own right. So there's not much to like to pause and go like, let me fill you in on the lore. And stuff like that. I feel like I could do that more with Marvel shit than anything else, right? Watching The Last of Us is, is its own experience. But Fallout, what's interesting about the show is that they're telling... Their own story, which is mm-hmm. kind of, it kind of feels like a new Fallout game in that regard, that they're not direct sequels from each other. Right. And um, the only thing that matters is, is you know, the basic premise. War never changes. Sorry. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no Ron Perlman yet? <laughs> which is a kind of a problem. Actually, shocking that they didn't find a character for him. Actually, they haven't done that, have the no, War never changed. Well, I guess, because yeah, whatever. Maybe season two. Well, you th- they'll say that. You'll get to that. <laughs> so I'm going into this basically with the, the, the challenge of myself of like, I'm not going to speak up at all. Because I'm really interested in the quality of the show for someone who's just interested in a new post-apocalyptic sci-fi show that just happens to be based on a video game. And so that's kind of the, the angle I'm coming at it from. And, and so far, I will say, so far, so good. The people involved seem to be fans, but are also in, interested in telling a good story that just happens to be set in this in this premise, in this world, and doing their own thing. No, absolutely. So, it's weird because I come to the show with, like, a lot of baggage, right? Like I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I know the whole thing. So, I'll say, first of all, spoilers-ish. Uh, I'm not sure how much we'll spoil, but if you've not seen the show, probably watch it, I guess? Yeah. And then come back. I don't We'll see. We'll see. We haven't created a checklist of spoilers we're going to cover. No, we haven't. Um, but what I found is that, you know, when I started watching it, uh, first of all, I think it's a great show. I really enjoyed it. I think they did a lot of things right. But So you finished it. Yes. I've seen the whole series now. I would say, like, the first episode, actually the first two, but the first episode really felt like it was a Fallout game. Yeah. It starts with, like, here's an introduction to the world. From the perspective of a Fallout dweller, which yeah. most of, or a vault dweller, which most mm-hmm. of the games do. Yes, right? that's the player character. That's that's like, if you play, if you if you wouldn't picked up a Fallout, uh, at least a modern Fallout, uh, actually Fallout 1, 3, 4, and 76, you would start from that same perspective. Right. Ish. Like, okay, cool. It Like, yeah. it felt like this was, it had that, like, it felt like the game. But also, it was a 
compelling story, right? It was mm-hmm. like, oh, what's going on? This is this is interesting. What is his fault? What is going yeah. on? You know? Yes, yes. I think that's you bring up a good point here. Like, there's enough there for to to hook fans of the series, and I think generally fans of whatever era of the series you want to be a fan of. I think they can get you if you are if you're one of those diehard fans of the first two games. And like, like, sure, it, maybe the few fans that are like their favorite Fallout game is Fallout Tactics, and then definitely, of course, obviously, it's really pulling from the Bethesda era. Mm-hmm. And for me, like, I kind of had like my checklists of like not necessarily what I wanted to see, but maybe what I was expecting to see. The main thing I had after the first episode is it's really more aesthetic than anything. Where like when that vault door opens, I want that blinding light because <laughs> I loved. I remember when I played Fallout Three for the first time. Mm-hmm. So uh, my 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 experience with the games is I'd heard about them a lot and they seemed to be up my alley, but I wasn't a PC gamer. And it wasn't until God the PS One era is that right? No, it was PS2 era, sorry. I was I was living in a house with some friends, and I had a PC. <laughs> you can see how I contextualize the different parts of my life. Like, what, which console what did console I have? What console did you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was like 2005, and I had a PC, and someone got me a copy of Fallout 1. Or no, it was Fallout 2. And for some reason, my, my computer wasn't running it. I don't know what was going on. But I tried, and I'm like, well, this seems really cool, but... Also, I had just no context really as a player right. for for isometric RPGs. When I would say that Fallout Two is actually, uh, with all respect to the fans, probably the single worst starting point. <laughs> Fair, but so my true introduction was Fallout Three. Three, yeah. I basically got my Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty in preparation to play that game, and have have quite enjoyed the series ever since. So a lot of my my sort of contextualization of Fallout is around the Bethesda look of it, which is the one thing like the one thing I'll praise the show for is yeah, it's it's a it's a good Fallout story. It kind of ticks all the the basic boxes, but man, it looks like Fallout. It <laughs> like, does. No, it really does. They, like especially those vaults, it looks so good. It's crazy. Absolutely, like the. The vault suit, like it's, mm-hmm. it looks right. And I've actually, I read an article where they say that like they did spend like an, a, a dumb amount of time making sure like the color looked right of the suit, right? Like the blue looked like the right blue. Yeah. Um, also, like the idea that like the, you know, stuff in the vault looked right, right? Like the door was the right height, which yeah. that's, I mean, normally I would say, and actually I would say, Seeing a character like when, when I think Lucy she holds out uh, at some point she has a the the her a handgun the, the not actually maybe it's maybe it's not her oh it's like that weird dark gun thing kind of thing not the dark gun oh. uh, at some point there there are characters who have basically the ten millimeter pistol right uh, and they're holding it out and you're like wow that is exactly <laughs> yeah and like whoever modeled that weapon like sit, <laughs> sat there and played. All the games and like, yeah, let's let's make it look like that, which is unnecessary, right? Like, yeah. you could have done your own thing, which yeah, other sure. other shows and stuff based on games have done, but they're like, no, let's like let's hire the guy that's really into it to go do that, right? You know? I and mean, think about it, like Bethesda has, I mean, and and the developers before them have put hundreds of thousands of dollars into this into this concept art, right? right. Like, you have a trove to work from. The only kind of inauthentic thing I would say, not to like throw some shade on it at the beginning, but like the my only problem with the first episode one is that like it was it was fifty four minutes and that's only about half the time you need to actually get through the character creator. <laughs> Although I will say Lucy is so interesting. she's like such an interesting looking actress. I'm like yeah she she looks like she came out of a character creator. <laughs> I will say. Uh... I actually was looking, what was it, like the Reddit Fallout subreddit? Um, and just seeing people who are actually now making their Fallout 4 character to look like Lucy. <laughs> Incredible. I will admit, I am not through the show yet. I mean, that's not surprising to any regular listener of the show. I am, I am slow when it comes to watching TV shows. I'm episode four, is it of ten episodes? Eight. Oh, okay, so I'm about halfway through. Yeah. But... I'm not gonna. We're not gonna hold the the conversation hostage to what I have or have not seen. Partly because I'm like, 
I'm getting enough sense like oh it's a Fallout show like it's it's a Fallout show I right. I I've played enough Fallout now to kind of know not to be surprised. Uh, I doubt that they're going to color two outside of the lines, but they're going to do something interesting. Honestly, I would say nothing against Bethesda, but like the stories they're telling of those games is not like the main arc is not really the draw of those games. It's it's the it's the emergent narrative that that comes from it. Yes. So like like the bar I would say is kind of low, and so far I think it's some of the best Fallout storytelling I've seen in like a, a focused narrative kind of way. So here's where I'll go, mm-hmm. uh, what I'll say. And I, to me, it's interesting. Like the idea that if you play Fallout, uh, at least the Bethesda ones, I don't mm-hmm. actually, this is actually, this was a thing where I tried to do research on how early in the Fallout series did they start to do certain story narratives. And yeah. I honestly don't know. I think it may have been the original, but I just don't know. But I know, I'll get to this. Uh, the <laughs> idea that if you play Fallout, and basically if you play Fallout and read the journals, right? Like you read right, all right. the the shit about pre-war Fallout, like pre-war America. Mm-hmm. You have a very, like you're being basically shown a very grim world, right? Like the idea that these big companies like Vault Tech, the people that build the vaults, are not actually interested in good things. Like, they're not trying to help people. They're doing fucked up shit. Like, the idea that the vaults, what we learn is that most of them, not all of them, most of them are experiments. Yeah. So, that's a that's a narrative that, like, most... If you play the game, and I guess you're like a... You don't read... You're like, oh, I have to shoot stuff, right? Like, but if you read, you're like, oh wow, they're telling a story, which again, I'd say is it it's a late stage capitalism, like, right, wow, right. this world really sucked before the bombs fell. I was so indoctrinated into that idea of like, oh, the vaults are experiments was starting the first episode and seeing they're in Vault 33, I'm like, okay, what's the kink of this vault? Right. And that's and that's like if you're a fan of the show, you're like or a fan of the, the 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 series, you're like, oh, so what is the kink? Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then seeing them like with the whole 32 exchange at the, in the first, I'm like, okay, this is going to be wild. Yeah, and it was. And it was, but not not in a way that that you're like, well, this was. I would say actually, having seen that, you're like, oh, this this happened. This was not the like, what's the, what's the gimmick, right? Like, mm-hmm. and you have not gotten to the gimmick. Uh, okay. Spoiler, you'll find For out later. 33 specifically. Uh, and 32. And 31. Mm-hmm. It's a triad, actually. Oh. But you'll see the gimmick later. Mm-hmm. But the idea that, like, that's that's what the, the series always kind of alluded to this. And what I think, the, or the, 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 the game series. But what the mm-hmm. TV show does is it actually grabbed that and ran with it. I, what I want to say is that the TV show actually does something that the game really can't do. With regard to the story, it takes the pre-war narrative and makes it part of the show. Yeah. Right. Like if, if like it, it has there, there are, there's a character who has a pre-war narrative. The ghoul. The right? ghoul. Yeah. The uh, ghoul. What's his name? Uh, Walton Cooper. Goggins. Oh, the, 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 the character's name. Yeah. The actor's name. Uh, Cooper or something rather. But like the idea that we get to see the pre-war era through his eyes. Yes. Yeah. And, and in that story, which goes through the whole season, we see basically like the kind of shit that used to only be through notes and through journal entries. We see it happening to someone and it is like there, and you'll spoiler, you'll see this Dan. Like it is like, there's some shocking ass shit where you're like, Oh boy, they just really did that. (laughs) (laughs) But again, pre-war. It's it, so. I was thinking about that aspect of it a lot because it's pretty prevalent, even at, from the beginning. I mean, the first scene of the episode is kind of sets it's that up. It's pre-war, right? The ghoul is really interesting because, admittedly, I don't, I haven't memorized all the lore of Fallout. The emphasis on the ghoul as a character, as a character with depth, as a character with uh, with a story to tell, 
that more than anything else, aside from the visuals, really seemed like a Bethesda era kind of narrative choice that the that the show is carrying on. Because I mean, that was a big part of Fallout Four, if I remember correctly. Oh, and the, well, the synthetics as well. Right. But there were some pretty prominent non-feral ghouls in Fallout Four, as well as Fallout Three. But I remember them. I just I, that really stood out to me in Fallout Four when I saw that Walton Goggins was playing this character and that they technically, I mean, they literally start the show with his character. I'm like, okay, they're they're leaning into this. And I think just because, especially with the newer games, they're seeing how much narrative potential. There is with a character like this. There is sort of an arc of the narratives they're telling because Fallout 4 is probably the closest we get to like having the pre-war right. narrative play a, a huge part in the actual story of the game because you are a character in Fallout 4. Spoilers. For that game. <laughs> who uh, is alive before He's the war. Yeah. yeah, and then you get frozen, then yeah, then the story starts. So yeah, it, I do see a lot of DNA, I guess is what I'm saying, from... The Bethesda, especially from the Bethesda era Fallout games. Yeah, absolutely. Though I am notably ignorant on on the original games, but more specifically, that they're pulling. I I feel some of the 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 growth of narrative choices and focus from Fallout three and four. They're kind of picking up where Fallout four left off and and running from there, which kind of to me also makes it makes us really feel like yeah it's it's a fall it's it's like a capital f fallout show it's it's almost like it's it's another entry into the series it's just not a video game yeah no actually i would say absolutely this and what i I guess thinking about that Mm -hmm. the show contributes to the world so every game does right like every game does and sometimes they write con shit that's fine sure i don't care but every game contributes to the world this show is part of that. Like it's Absolutely. it's that tradition yeah. of contributing to the world, but in a way that the games really couldn't do, which I already said. And I would say that like this one as as you'll see a little bit, I don't want I'm not gonna spoil too much for you, <laughs> but what like they kind of set up this idea that I mean, I would say the show kind of not doesn't break the fallout world, uh, in so much it the idea that so if you start watching the show and you know Fallout, you'll see that the the this character Cooper uh, Coop, um, mm-hmm. he's a cowboy who wears a costume that's in the vault the the fault the, like the vault yeah. vault tech colors, and you're like wow that's and, and I remember watching with with my partner is like oh look he's he's in that color and mm. then you find out those aren't vault tech colors those are his colors oh interesting yeah. Right, and then eventually you see him become the spokesperson for Vault Tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the thumbs up things came from. And right, yeah. oh, like the and and the show kind of it doesn't uh, actually. I will say it doesn't in this season like finish the story, mm. but the idea that he became the spokesperson and then something went wrong yeah. and he got. Uh, we assume he gets replaced by. Uh, was it Pip Boy? I think is what right, we right, call right. it. In which and there's a scene in the show where he sees that 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 character and literally on a like as in the post apocalyptic world he sees it and shoots out the face. Yeah, right? yeah. Like that's at, at actually at the end of episode four or three. Yeah, um, uh, three. Yeah, three. Mm-hmm. But this idea that like wow, you just you added to the world with this idea that like that whole thing that we now know is like the the mascot the, right? the mascot of the yeah. series was in fact based on this wild west star that was, that was yeah that's quite a revelation even when like he, he first put on the, the vault tech outfit to do the advertisements for it and they had like can you stick your thumb up i'm like oh shit this is like he's he's pit boy that's crazy right but then it goes wrong and they replace him with an animated character right like <laughs> hey which also yeah if only yeah. all of us could earn such a fate Kind of the, the final statement I'll say on this before kind of signing off my portion of this conversation is what I really like, and this is something that the game can't do either, considering it's a first person game. You are the camera, so the camera follows mm-hmm. your little viewpoint. But the ability to bounce back and forth between characters, and those characters represent different sects or different aspects of this post apocalyptic world. So, bouncing be- at least at the beginning between Lucy, between the ghoul between Maximus, which who we haven't talked about at all, 
I really like that. That's I, that's what I find the most additive and interesting part of what this TV show can do that the games, I guess the games could do, but it would fundamentally change how these games normally work. Right. I re, I'm really fascinated just as a guy that likes character stuff, what they're doing with Maximus. This guy, it's like the actor is so good at, the at, actor's at great. Na- navigating that change. And I mean, I disagree with your, your take on what's going on. But. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm only four episodes in, and in episode four, he's not in it at all. It just gives us, and, and for a person who likes the games, it's given me an angle into a faction that, obviously, you get to, depending on who you ally with in the games, you can get more information about the Brotherhood of Steel or mm-hmm. not, but by just having a care, but that's all through the lens of, of being an outsider, a vault dweller, who has to become an ally with the Brotherhood of Steel in the show. It's like, no, we can just go to them and see what that culture is like on its own without that outsider status. I, I find it fascinating and disturbing. I mean, the whole show is kind of gross in its own way, but that's also fallout, right? When, <laughs> when we first see the ghoul proper and he's like, in that town, like blowing people's limbs off. I'm like, this is disgusting. What are they doing? But then I'm like, no, that's that's a perk that's in fallout. the game. That's, a, <laughs> that's like, you no, do. he has the perk that lets yeah. him blow bloody mess, yeah. right, or something like that. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's actually, I, I do feel like that's a thing, right? Like it felt like there's moments where you're like, oh, that's yeah, that's this thing. Like the, yeah. clearly, the ghoul had bloody mess. You know, mm-hmm. whatever. You know, like this character had that. It's a weird thing to have a show that that was like felt good, like it was a it was yeah. a fun show that also did like the the deference to the source material. It's not shying away from it. It's not hiding it. No, it's not. It, 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 it's, I, I would actually argue it's it's both doing a show and also respecting like not respecting. I don't want to be weird about that. If you know the game. There's lots of splashes and teasers mm-hmm. and, and fun stuff that if you know, you're like, yeah, that's the thing. And if you don't, you don't miss anything. I think you said it best. Like, it's contributing to the right. overall series. And that's the interesting contrast with something like The Last of Us, which I don't think is... It's it's definitely not hiding the fact that it was a video game. But that was approach from, like, this game is great. We can make it a good TV show. And it's... It, there's there's like a line being drawn. It's like there's the game, and we are taking that and making it, you know, a, a prestige television, right? And but also that's that's it's a difference between prem between the premise of these games. Like that's such a narrative heavy show about specific characters, and I don't know if they could have done a last of a show that was about completely different characters and have it work as well. Right. Um, but Fallout, just by the nature of what the game is, sets sets up a good TV show by its very premise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad that they finally had the time, the money, the budget, and the uh, the cast and the writing to actually do that justice. So I will also just want to add uh, music. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. So Fallout has always been known, at least since Fallout 3. I think Fallout 1 and 2 had a few videos with, with, like, music that, that will make sense when I talk about it a bit. But... Fallout 3 was actually the first one where they basically went hard into the music of the era. And by the era, I mean the 40s and 50s. Right. The ink spots and whatnot. Right. Uh, to the point where, like, they the idea that you could tune into your ra- to the radio on your Pip-Boy and hear music from the pre-war era. And apparently it's all from the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Right, right. But what I like about the show is that they Bethesda curated an entire catalog of music that I assume at this point is all public domain, mm-hmm. or at least mostly. And they used it not in a way that the game does it, which is it just plays in the background. Yeah, diegetically. They used it here where it's like, we're going to choose the songs. And honestly, they do this through the, all eight episodes where it this song actually kind of matters to this scene. Thematic importance, for sure. Right. And they do that, and they kind of nitpick across the Fallout music They do. I was really impressed, yeah. Yeah. Hearing World on Fire was like... But it it goes through the whole series where it's like, I don't... Actually, I would say you don't hear the same song twice. Yeah. Except that every time you hear one, you're like, well, fuck, you did that. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Maybe they can finally get 
a, a s- compilation CD released of all these wonderful songs together instead of having to use Spotify playlists or something. But, Maybe Amazon has the has the the money and the the cachet to to make that happen. So it was like that's one of the things where for me as someone who hears the songs and I know that there's actually a lot more that by the end of season one they haven't played, and I know where they're going with the show. They have a whole bunch more they they could use for sure. It is it's a cool thing because actually like these a lot of the songs some of them are weird. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, like. Uh, you know, crawl out through the fallout, right, which right. I think ends the first episode. I was, the joke is before I started watching the show, I'd be walking around the house singing that song. And my partner's like, that's a weird song. <laughs> and then as we're watching the show, it ends with that. And you're like, wait, is this a real song? And you're like, yes, someone wrote that in the forties. or whatever. <laughs> Like, you know, there's a lot of weird... how can we cash in on the zeitgeist of the day of the nuclear, whatever. Yeah, like <laughs> there's a lot of like weird shit, which also I love. Bethesda went and found a lot of weird. I mean, shit. that's the thing. I think those songs are just are capsules of the whole weird ass tone of Fallout. Right. Like you can't you can't do a show and not have those songs. And I'm glad yeah. they they went through the effort to get the licensing. Hopefully, it for the licensing. For the licenses, for the they ones needed. that need it, yeah, right. they did that because it's which I again I assume most of those are probably donated. The last thing they need is a Ron Perlman vi- voiceover, and then they'll have everything locked in. Because hmm. I mean, do they even say? You can spoil this for me. Do they ever say that war war never changes? <laughs> I think they say it multiple times. Okay, okay <laughs> just okay. not Ron Perlman. He does not like show up and be like, "War never changes." That's a problem. We need to solve that. Maybe he's actually, maybe he's in it. He he plays the Brotherhood of Steel armor. He is the armor. Uh, so, actually, what I will say is they have recast some iconic voices. Okay. Um, I think the the one you'll, you know, that I think you, you already saw, uh, Mr. Handy oh, has Matt been recast. Bay. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, and yes. The funny thing is. <laughs> Let me help you. I'm here to harvest your organs. Yes. I feel I feel bad that uh, did you see actually I should say did you see the episode where you f- see where that voice comes from? No, no. Okay, there's a yeah he shows up in another episode. Okay, I feel bad because you know whoever the original voice actor was like that's fine, dude. Like, if you get replaced by Matt work. Berry, that's fine. <laughs> right, like, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's fun is that like you know they 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 cast him as it. As Mr. Handy, and then in a later episode, they give you context for why does Mr. Handy sound like that? Mm-hmm. Which, again, like building on the world of like, wh- where does Mr. Handy's voice come from? Oh, it was an actor that they licensed. Right. And and another thing that would just be buried in logs and journals. In a log, right. right. Yeah. And, which means like, information that could be easily kind of go in one ear and not the other, because there's a lot of that shit in those games, right? Yeah. That's cool, man. It's so cool. I'm very, 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 really rarely get to say that, you know, an adaptation is done right. And I feel like we've had more misses than than hits lately. We got that the Borderlands movie coming out sometime soon. They released a trailer, released a trailer for that. Uh, video games are, are hot business, and uh, they are. It's nice to see a big fat W in the form of Fallout. Right, and let's think back to our childhood, mm. Street Fighter. In contrast, we're making a show or a, t- a movie about a game, and it's so like respectful to the point where it's part of the narrative of the game. Right now, right, right. Like honestly, Fallout the show is now part of the Fallout narrative. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's such a weird place to be from the world that gave us Street Fighter. So if you, dear listeners, have any thoughts about the topics we discussed this week, feel free to leave your thoughts as comments on the page for this episode of ForAllIntents.net. You can also post your comments or engage in conversations with other listeners on our Facebook page. You can find us on other social media as well, specifically the places that Andrew and I frequent, which means you can find me on Instagram at DBethelComics, and you can find Andrew on Mastodon at ProfoundDarkAtDice.Camp. While you're at our website at ForAllIntents.net, you can also take a look at our YouTube page, which you actually may already be there if you are there, or you find yourself there and you're listening to our show, which it's there. Please like and subscribe, or as the kids like to say, ring that bell. We use two tracks of music for our show. One is called Disco Meduse, the other is called District 4. 
They've both written and performed by Kevin McLeod of the Clan McLeod, immortal swordsman, graph paper enthusiast, and musician extraordinaire. You can find his music and more at incompetech.filmmusic.io, and that's all licensed under the Creative Commons 4.0 Attribution License. If you like the show, like to help us out, the best way to do so would be to subscribe to the show using whichever podcasting service you happen to use. What would help us out even more, though, would be to leave some sort of review, whether a text review or using the proprietary metric will spread the word to new potential listeners to the magic of algorithm. Algorithms. Speaking of adaptations, I can't let this episode go. I can't let this week go without mentioning the trailer that dropped on Monday. Oh, the new the new uh, Wolverine movie. No, the new Deadpool and Wolverine film, Deadpool three. Dead Deadpool. That's what they call me, honey. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, Deadpool three. Woo! Yeah, Deadpool got an official trailer release, which is interesting in in the context of the teaser that came out a few months ago because that one leaned heavily into the MCU thing side of things and, and especially into the humor side of things and this this one presented kind of a different animal so the thing that surprised me the most as a fan of of well just be honest as a fan of the 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 Fox X-Men universe but also mm-hmm. as an X-Men fan really surprised by the amount of pathos in this trailer it seems like Ryan Reynolds is there as Deadpool to make the funny, and they brought in Hugh Jackman to to lay down the uh, the feels. Right. And it seems like it might be a very I don't want to say a very thoughtful Deadpool movie, which are are thing are, which is a description you never ever say <laughs> about Deadpool. <laughs> the last film that Wolverine was in, Logan, was uh, was ostensibly an adaptation of a comic book story called Old Man Logan, which is takes place in, in the Downing. post-apocalyptic yeah. world and and it was a very loose at it it wasn't an adaptation at all but it pulled ideas from this the funny thing is that looking at this story it looks like it's another adaptation of old man logan but a, perhaps an authentic adaptation of the comics <laughs> specifically the stuff that they can do now which is lean into in that original comic story the the larger universe of it the there's a gigantic dead ant man or i guess giant man at that point right like that's from the comics and We'll see kind of how much more it pulls, and it seems like the the Wolverine that they're pulling from the, in this movie is is definitely pulling from that Logan in the in that comic book storyline, in, in that he he shares a very traumatic end to <laughs> to the X Men story. It's it's it looks really interesting and looks much more thoughtful and perhaps emotional than I would have expected from Deadpool, Deadpool. Three. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Are you intrigued? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, it looks like fun. Yeah. It looks like fun. It's, they've they've got, I mean, who knows what this movie's going to be It's going to be bonkers, right? yeah. So until your favorite character becomes Deadpool, dear listeners, I'm D. Bethel. And I'm Andrew Asplund. And for all intents and purposes, that was a podcast. That was all feet. <laughs> Just feet. Just feet. In the episode for Friday, April 12th, no, that's last week, April 26th. 26th. Yeah, we read calendars here. Are you ready? Yes. Let's let's see if we know how to do this thing. And so the first thing you said is like, you got Jersey finger. Um, And I'm like, I haven't been flipping anybody off. (laughs) And (laughs) he's like, no, no. I don't know what's going on. Like, why am I in pain? Right, right. Now I'm like, oh no, apparently I have old people. <laughs> I'm not done with my Sunday. Oh, uh, sorry. So oh, I came yikes. home. <laughs>